So I'm a printmaker. And sometimes online I go as Hey Peep because it's actually easier for people to spell that for whatever reason than my actual name. Um, I also have a sister who is a printmaker and so to create division <laughs> um, and separate our careers in some ways, I have chosen that sort of um, nickname as a way to be represented online. I also think it works really well in the realm of the internet and social media to have your own handle that is unique and doesn't involve a lot of complex or complicated numbers or characters. And so um, that's sort of my preface for this. So I mostly make screen prints. Um, I make lots of different kinds of prints and I teach all different kinds of printmaking. I teach intaglio and relief and everything in between. Um, but the thing that I love most tends to be screen printing and um, I like booklets and I am inspired heavily by comics and pop culture, etc. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came to find zines, why I think zines are interesting and why I think it's a really great thing to do with students and why I love doing it with students and love making zines with students and telling them about zines. Um, so when I graduated with my MFA, I went from having a really robust studio that I had access to, to being an adjunct professor at a very small school where I was told that there would be equipment. And there was, but um, it was really actually just one press and it was a community members and we weren't supposed to use it. Um, so I thought, okay, well that's a challenge. And they said, we, we want you to teach printmaking. <laughs> and I thought, okay. Um, but the, the thing that they did have amongst, they had a nice painting studio and some other things and some faculty that I enjoyed spending time with, but um, they had a copier, like a really nice copier. And I thought, what's so different about a copier than printmaking, really? You put an image in, you make multiples, and then you have many of something. So it's the same principle. It just doesn't have um, the sort of grand attachments that printmaking sometimes does. So um, as I was someone trying to navigate not having a studio, I realized that, well, I could use this copier and I could make multiples in that way. Um, the other thing is that when you're in grad school, probably most of us know, it becomes really insular. You have that immediate community and you're not necessarily reaching out to the greater community, except maybe at conferences or if someone has a similar research to you. So the other thing that I was trying to do is like, I've got to make connections and I've got to find my way um, out of this tiny community into a bigger community, even if that just means through the internet. At the same time, Instagram was becoming a really big thing. Um, and so I thought, OK, I can connect with people. I can make zines, and I can send zines to people. So that was really interesting to me, this sense of having a greater community, even when you're living in a really rural place. So the place I was living um, had not very many people in town and very few artists. And uh, I think there were a 1,000 students at the school, and most of those were not art students. So. Um, I started making zines, and so this is one of the first zines that I made in great quantity, um, which is just made on a copier in black and white. It was a black and white drawing, and then I ran a bunch, folded them, and then I sent them out to people that wanted them. So I just said, at the time, Tumblr was also sort of a big thing, and so I went on my various social media and said, I'll send you a zine if you want a zine. And if you want to send me a zine in return, that would be great, and we can start a conversation. And so um, something that I've brought today that I'll talk about here more in more detail is that I've brought a lot of zines that I've collected over the years. And so part of that is through things like trades. Um, but I also think there's a level of complexity that can happen with a small art object, which is what, how I see zines. So um, loosely defined, zines can be any sort of self-published ephemera. So poets like them, um, members of societies, or groups that are underrepresented, it's a great way to make your own message and get it out there and get it into the hands of the people, right? Which is another thing that I loved about it because that connects so directly with printmaking. Printmaking is all about making multiples and reaching a greater audience and how does that communication expand the community, expand collaboration? How do you, um, how do you make those connections and make them lasting connections? And so uh, zines are even tend to be or can be even less expensive, which additionally makes them that much more accessible, right? Um, and when I'm thinking about this with students too, is that they're going to leave here someday, just like I left my university, and they're going to need access to things. And one of they may not have access to print facilities, but they will likely have access to a copier or 
they will have access, it, they would have enough money to produce zines in some quantity, more likely than making prints. So um, the other thing I started playing with was that depending on the copier you have access with, to, you can really make a really finessed um, little art object on there. So it's related to bookmaking, it's related to printmaking, it's related to all these interesting things and it ties directly into the internet and um, the belief in the multiple and the belief of dissemination of information. And so um, I started playing around with running different layers through, much like you would a screen print. So I would scan something in, um, run it in black, scan something else in, make it red, run it through there, and then you can start to actually layer colors in a copier, which is really similar to something called a risograph, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but then also as I found my way back to being able to make things like screen prints, I also found that that ties directly into zine making, right? You can make screen printed zines and they're just a little bit nicer feeling and they're a little bit, um, they do something a little bit different. So that ink is gonna sit on that paper differently than it would um, a copier ink would. So um, many times when I show, I have a takeaway at my shows. Uh, so someone maybe not can't afford the print or can't have the print, but they can have the takeaway. And the takeaway means that maybe they'll remember having been at that show. It's like a souvenir of that experience. And that always resonated with me. Um, as was mentioned, I grew up in West Virginia. I, my parents were great, super supportive. My family loves the arts. Um, but when you're living somewhere rurally, you don't always have as immediate access to the arts as you might otherwise. Um, so this is another example of me playing with the copier. So I started to play with other folds as well. And that's something that's really great about the zine community in general and printmakers is that they want to share information. It's like built into how they operate. They don't care about keeping secrets. They want you to know about what they do and they want everyone to be able to have access to these things. So um, if you do quick internet searches, you can find a lot of information really quickly and then you can make connections and those connections are really what led me to um, making more and more and more of these zines and it becoming a major component of my research and a major component of teaching. So um, in the print world, there's a thing called print portfolios and uh, typically they ask for a flat print that's a certain size um, that you make in multiple and everyone gets one and it becomes a, a set or a suite of prints that exists in tandem. Um, so this was a zine that I made for one that was supposed to be a non-traditional portfolio in the sense that you sent double the amount that they would normally accept and then the additional edition was then handed out to the community in some form. So a number of these exist in places that I don't even know and that's interesting to me as well is that someone could be connecting with the artwork that I made or maybe I'll someday meet them again um, and I had no idea that it ever found its way into their hands. So these are all screen printed and then the, the slip around them is actually done on a copier. So printmakers love to talk about process also. So if you ever have a question about any of the things I'm talking about, um, feel free to ask at the end of this. I'm happy to answer those questions. Um, this is another copier zine. This was inspired by uh, my cat, Goblin, who is scared of everything. I have this here today. So if you want to actually look through these. So I think it's really important to note that part of the reason I brought so many of these with me is that these are not meant to be experienced solely in an, a still image. They are objects and they are meant to be handled, which I know is not super ideal for the current <laughs> state of things, um, but we do have hand sanitizer here. So I do want you to um, experience these in person and I think experiencing those is actually what spurs conversation and discussion and questions. This is um, some zines that I made in hot pink using screen printing. Um, Again, combining those different processes. So I produced this as a copier zine, but I also produced it as a screen printed zine. Here they are all folded up. Zines look great in a pile. <laughs> um, this is a slightly more complicated one. So um, most of my imagery features these cast of sort of lumpy, grumpy creatures and their uh, projection of my feelings sometimes and personification of folks that I know and they're cramped and they're trying to navigate the world together, but you know, they're contained to this, they're confined to this specific space, right? So most of my zines tend to be image based, um, but zines can be anything and they can have text or they can be solely text or they can be a comic and, or they can be, you know, one big image that's been folded into a shape. And so that is the other thing that I love, love, love about zines. And I think it's really great for students is that it can really be anything. 
And so it makes it available to anyone. This is a zine that I produced on a risograph. So I mentioned risograph earlier. I have some examples of this. A risograph is a duplicator, so it's very much like a copier. You may have used one and didn't realize that it was um, not a copier. And uh, it works sort of like a screen print. You run it in layers. So the thing that I was talking about doing with a copier earlier, you can actually do with a risograph. And these are sort of in vogue right now for self-publishing because you can produce many, many, many um, like high quality prints um, in a short period of time. Uh, so this is one I made in collaboration with my friend Josh, who runs a press in New Hampshire called Direct Tango Press. Um, he also helped me make this one as well. So that's what I mean, is that a lot of these projects end up being something where the basis of it is that I am communicating with someone and we are working together, and that creates a friendship and something that doesn't always happen when you're working in your studio alone. Um, so this is that when it opens up. It's sort of an unusual fold. We, I mean, unusual-ish. It has like a fold out. Um, and we sort of made it up as we went along. I have an example of this here today. We also worked on this accordion one, the one that I pointed at the table. It's called Eye in the Dark. This one is more of a true collaboration. Um, he did all the landscape imagery, and then I responded to the landscape that he was using, which is actually from Georgia. Um, so. Uh, I have you know, my sort of stamp on this, and he has his stamp on it. And then I've also worked with uh, other folks who do the same process. So there's a, a place called Resolve in Pennsylvania, and they reached out to me, and they said, we've seen you've done some risograph things. And this is what I mean about conversation starting, right? Like, if I hadn't made those other things, I don't know that they ever would have contacted me. And they said, I know you've made these things. We want to work together. Uh, we know you made a suite of prints that was an alphabet. Can we produce that in zine or book form? And so they did. And they printed this in color. And it's a whole alphabet. And we produced those in great quantity. And then we actually sold those. Um, those were a little more of an investment. So handing those away is a little different. <laughs> um, but yeah. These are some of the pages from that. I also brought an example of this today. So if you want to look through all those, you're more than welcome to. Um, and then, of course, anytime I'm doing something in my own studio practice, it almost always shows up in my teaching. Um, and I think that's what's so beautiful about doing research is that ultimately it benefits your students, is that you're doing all these things. And so you can connect your students with these resources. You can connect your students with new ideas. And so um, when I got the job here, I was really excited. I'm going to show you some older work as well. Because they said, well, you can teach a special topics class. What do you want it on? And I was like, well, I know what I want to do. <laughs> um, so I made a flyer for it. Um, and I had, I think there were seven students in that class. And they were really, really, really great. And I'll talk about them soon. And I actually brought a lot of their work to show you today. Because I thought you'd be interested to see that there's great stuff coming from the classes from our students like just here on campus with these simple ideas. And so the other thing that I um, do is I teach foundations classes. And so um, I found that this is a really good, pretty quick uh, way of connecting with students. Um, and again, I went back to this idea of the copier zine. It's inexpensive, and you can do it. So in my 2D, 2D class, um, I had them do introduction zines. So on the first day, we all sat down. And I said, you're going to make a zine about you. You can tell us anything about it. It just needs these three pieces of information. And then you can approach it however you want from there. It needs to be mostly drawn. I was like, I'll draw one too. We'll make enough copies so we can all trade. That way, you know everybody in your class right off the bat. And these are freshman students that are coming in. And so it's really important for them to establish that cohort. I know we talk about co cohorts all the time. But how do we get them to actually speak with one another? <laughs> um, this is a really great way to do that. And you could do it in just about any class. And all you need is a copier. And you're only going to make like maybe a couple hundred copies. So, um, And it's really low pressure. So I was like, it doesn't have to be beautiful. Like, think about what you want it to look like. Make it the best you can possibly make it. But um, we're going to trade, and that way you know, you know some things about each other. So mine had that I drink a mocha every morning, and that I'm from West Virginia, and I have three cats. And then I had some other information in there. And they had similar things. Like, a lot of them wanted to say where they were from, or they wanted to say like, what their favorite thing was. And so um, it was a nice way to get people also making. That's a challenge in art classes. If you've been in an art class, people want to think for a long time about something. And sometimes the practice of making is what really is what gets things going, gets the ideas flowing. 
Um, so when I was in Utah, so before I was here, I taught as an adjunct in Utah. Um, and they also, somehow, I convinced them to let me teach a zines class. Um, so I did a similar thing with my students there. And uh, this is the same method I mentioned before, where they ran it through multiple times in layers. So much, most of my students there were not freshmen. They were, in this particular class, they were printmaking students. So they wanted it to connect directly to printmaking. So I went back to that idea of, well, we'll run it through multiple times. We'll see how those colors layer, et cetera. And, um, Usually there is a loose prompt for each of these. I find that if I leave my themes a little more open, uh, students, it gives them more agency in what they're making. And I think that they're more invested in that way. I know I am when people aren't giving me like such constraints. Like, um, and because I love screen printing and I teach screen printing all the time, uh, I gave them the option to design a screen printed zine that had to be a certain amount of layers. And so this one was actually pretty neat. I don't have a copy of this. I wish I did. I left it for the Utah State Archives. Um, but each of these panels opens up and it has a room. And I thought that was really clever. And they were printed really nicely and he made these in multiple. And so each of those panels opens up and you can see a aerial view of the room in this black magic house. Um, I have this one here. This is all, uh, it's a field guide of little animals. It's all screen printed. It's very small, but um, fine quality. And then they set up at a research fair and showed work. And then we also delivered a bunch of zines to the community, um, which is another thing that is important, right? We talk about engaging with the campus community and the regional community. Like, how do you do that? Give away zines. People will pick them up and they'll take them. If they don't keep them forever, that's OK. If they keep them forever, great. Um, so we actually had some at a local pizza place there that was pretty hip and happening. And they were like, zines, all right. So um, we gave them a bunch and we would re restock every so often. They would actually go pretty fast. When you find when something's free, people take it. Um, like I said, they set up at a research fair at the library there and shared zines with their academic community as well. And then I have some examples from when I taught here. Um, this is from a graduate student. And, uh, I just thought it was a nice one we have here. It's all about a specific artist that she's interested in. And then as a group, um, I've talked to a few people about this. Uh, their culminating project after they'd made all these individual zines was that they had, to they had to come together, work together, and make a plan for a zine. And I didn't care what it was so long as it was a complete thought and um, it went beyond just being some, a pretty object. And so they actually went all out and they said, we're going to do a field guide for Johnson City. We're going to do all this research. Um, we're going to hand draw everything. We're going to make a map. We're going to hand them out to the community. And I thought, I don't have to do any work. These people are great. <laughs> um, but they were really excited about doing it. And it was a really great group of students. And so I have, like I said, I have some examples here today of those. Um, it's not meant to be everything about Johnson City. It's just some things from their perspective that they wanted to give. If someone was new coming to Johnson City, here's some information we would love for you to have. Um, and so they made a multi-page zine. We produced that. There's about 100 of those. And they ended up in local businesses left in various places. And most of them vanished. So they're somewhere. <laughs> The other thing I organized at one point in time, um, and I'm thinking about doing another one of these, is that I organized a zine swap between institutions. So um, this is my little illustration for that. I invited something like 11 institutions to participate. And most of them were printmaking uh, professors or printmaking instructors. And they had their students make zines. And they sent them all to me. And then um, we displayed them in a big group. But they also got their own selection back. So it acted as a portfolio. So th this collection of zines is actually in like 10 different university libraries. So what a great thing for students, right? It's all student work, except for the exception of a few instructors. And so it was really exciting to be part of something so big. And they, I know that a lot of the students connected with um, the subject matter. Again, it was an open subject matter. They could make whatever they wanted. Um, so long as it was under a certain size so I could fit it all in a box and ship it back to them. I have some of these here today as well. I couldn't bring them all because there's 112 of them or something. And so I wanted to show you some things from here. 
Um, but these are some shots of the actual installation. This was also shown at a printmaking conference additionally. So their work got seen at Utah State where I taught, but it also got shown um, at the Mid-America Print Council Conference in Wyoming. And so again, this is a big deal for students who want lines on the resume and want to reach out to the greater community. Um, so the other thing, again, endless collaborations, right? So this is a, a manifesto <laughs> that I wrote um, with my friend Tanya, who's also a screen printer. And we submitted this to a periodical zine called Power Washer. And so I included this because this is another way that zines happen, right? You can make your own, but you can also be part of these collaborative zines that other people are producing. And so we submitted this, and this is a bunch of sort of guides to what you should or shouldn't do in screen printing. And it's really meant to be a joke. Um, some people took it a little seriously, which was a little unnerving. Um, people were like, well, I don't think that number 10. And I was like, OK, well, you know, it's my opinion. Um, so anyway, that was printed in a zine called Power Washer that gets released every few months that's all about screen printing. And it's made on a risograph as well. Let's see if this does anything. And then I've been working on a series of zines in response to the things happening in the world very slowly because it sort of stresses me out. And I was going to call them Doom Spiral, and they were going to be like a small newspaper zine. Um, but <laughs> this one specifically was about when you're a woman of a certain age, you start to get asked certain questions a lot <laughs> um, and how that is stressful. So um, that's in process, though. But um, I wanted to include some information about how to find me. Uh, and then we'll, we'll transition into the looking at the zines and talking about folding zines. So my, like I said, my personal handle is Hey Peep. I post artwork and my cats. So that's your warning. And then I have an ETSU printmaking account that features just our student work. So if you're interested in what's happening in those studios, you're more than welcome to stop by, um, assuming we're not closed <laughs> for the next two weeks. Um, and uh, we post stories. I post opportunities and things like that. And uh, so you can check out what's happening in that studio. So now what? Um, now I want to direct your attention to uh, the things that I put on this table to show you. And I wondered if, how many people have made zines before? OK, some people have made zines. So what I was going to show you was many of these are folded from a single um, piece of copy paper. And I was going to show you some of those folds, because you can do those with your students. You can design it as a flat sheet, run it through the copier, and then fold them into a zine. So um, I'm going to hand out some paper, and we'll do those folds. And then after that, if you want to come up and look at these zines um, and really experience them, I think that would be great. Um, you're welcome to touch anything. Keep in mind there is hand sanitizer. I've been told I should warn people, you know, sanitize your hands before and after touching things. Um, so as I'm handing these out, I'll talk a little bit. I'm going to just hand stacks. Just take like four sheets of paper each. Sure, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. So as we're doing that, basically this table here are all zines that were made in ETSU classes in some capacity that I've taught. So there's examples of ones that we made in relief, um, a lot from the zine class, and then uh, a few from my screen printing class. And then this table here is from my collection. So I have basically this corner is stuff that I've made. So you've probably seen it in these pictures. And then here are just zines that I've collected over the years. Um, I go to zine fests and zine fairs, and I buy and trade for zines. So I actually have like a whole other box under here, and then a whole other box in my car. Um, so. They're inexpensive to collect as well. And um, they're just nice objects to have. And they cover like every imaginable topic that you can think of. I tend towards visual zines. I'm most interested in visual zines. But there's everything out there, right? OK. So I need paper, too. Where did the, let's see. Thank you. OK. So um, I'm going to show you the most basic one pretty much ever. OK, so this is a zine that I made to advertise the zine class. Talks about zines. It's really simple. But if you start to think about all of those panels as something that you can activate, um, 
then it becomes a much more interesting object than just a folded piece of paper, right? So you're going to take your paper and you're going to hold it vertically like this. Fold this in half down. So you're going to have this. And it's okay if your folds are a little wonky. We're sitting in chairs and we don't have a desk in front of us. <laughs> then you're going to fold it the opposite direction with the crease at the top. And so that's it. That could be a zine. <laughs> if you put information all over this and treat each panel like something special, then it turns into a zine, right? It turns into an object and it becomes something, it transcends just being a folded piece of paper, right? So this is one that I really like to do with um, printmaking students or offer it up as an option because it's pretty easy to plan. It doesn't have a ton of panels and there's no cutting involved. And um, because it's based on folds, you could do it with any sized piece of paper. Um, that if, if you're planning to have it go through a copier, then you would need to plan for that. But OK, so there's one. Grab another sheet of paper. So um, this is a slightly bigger size, but I'm going to show you that this is what we're ending up making is this is all going to be folds as well. So it has a front, it opens to two panels, then it opens to a long strip. And if I could get my hands on it, and then it opens to basically a poster on the inside. So to make that one, you're going to take it and hold it horizontally. I'm going to fold that in half. And I always have my crease at the top. Then you're going to fold that in half the opposite direction. All right. And then you're going to open it back up. And you're going to use this middle crease as a guide. You're going to fold this wing in towards the middle crease so it hits slightly before that middle crease. So since, can you see what I'm doing? I'm folding it in this way. So then you can see I've left like a little gap. And you're going to do the same thing on the other side, fold it in towards the crease. So the other great thing about zines, on top of all the other things that I've said are great about zines, is that after you've printed them, then you get to fold all of them, which means you can just sit and watch Netflix <laughs> and fold zines for an extended period of time. OK, so then with the crease at the top, you have the one that folds out, and then it folds out to that big spread in the middle, right? OK, so there's your second, second zine fold. All right. OK. This next one requires scissors. So it's going to take us a second, but that's OK. I'm going to show you it first, and then I have scissors to hand out, as long as they come back to me, hopefully. OK. So you're going to hold it horizontally, fold it in half. I always keep my crease at the top, fold that in half the opposite direction. So this will end up being the same size as the other one, but the format will be slightly different. And then you're going to fold it again in half the same direction you just folded it. So what that's going to do is create all the creases for you so that you can follow those as a guide when you go to refold this here in just a few minutes. Okay. This is one you may have made before. I made this a lot in elementary school. They were always having us make these little booklets. So then you're going to unfold it all, which gives you eight panels, right? So you're going to fold it the, this way. Like you hold it vertically and then fold it back down. And the reason we're doing this is so we can make a single cut and so I'm holding my, I have my crease at the top, and I'm going to cut all the way down 
to this, the corner of the first top panel. So then you have something that looks like this with the crease at the top. Everybody able to see that? Okay. So then from there, this one takes a little, a little paying attention. Um, you're gonna reopen it, fold it back the original way, and you're gonna end up with this little mouth. And then this folds into itself. And it turns into, a, I'm gonna show you that again. <laughs> and, it's gonna, and it folds into a page by page little book. And you can also design it so that if you want people to open it all the way, you could have a poster on the inside. Okay, so you have the little mouth. Burp, burp, burp. <laughs> and then you push those two corners together so you end up having a plus sign. And then you take this side of the plus sign and refold it over onto your other pages. And then you can sort of recrease it. This one, ten, you'll see there's a bunch of these up here that are like this. So um, I'm gonna pa pass some scissors around, which have been sanitized. <laughs> um, and then as you make your cut, just pass it to the next person so that they can make their cut, so they can complete their, their scene. And then when I'm making these usually, um, I usually have a, like a little mock-up that I make so that I can number what's gonna end up where and in what orientation. Because of the folding, it'll flip things upside down if you're not paying attention. Um, so I usually make a mock-up really quick and number all the pages, then open it up and see how I have to design it in order to um, go on to my next step, which is usually designing the actual finished piece. How are we doing? Does anyone need help? Looks like peop some people are. Yeah. Need that mouth to open. It didn't make any noise. Yeah. There you yeah, go. There you go. Perfect. And then, yeah, there you yeah. go. And then you can yeah. fold over it the... It doesn't really, as long as you're aware of it when you're designing the piece, ultimately. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and mine is sticking out, and that's just because of the way I folded it. Yeah. yeah. If we had tables and things, we would, we'd probably be doing a tidier job. But for this... Mine is... might still stick out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, but this is good. Yeah. 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 Good, good. Okay, and now we're gonna move on to the one that confuses everybody the most. <laughs> okay, so um, this is one of my favorite ones, and it's like a little accordion book. And again, this is some cuts and some folding, and that's it. And you can make it from any rectangular piece. So, this one requires lots of folding. So, vertically, fold that in half. Then in half the opposite direction. So you'll notice a lot of these repeat the same kind of folds, right? And then they diverge into a different plan. Then you're gonna fold that again in half the other way. And don't be concerned if this one looks a little messy because it tends to, especially on this small paper and when you don't have a table in front of you and things like that. And then you're gonna have the one that it's gonna look like all the other ones, but then you're gonna fold that in half down this way. And just like the other one, um, don't worry about getting this creased super well. Um, you're using these as a guide ultimately to refold it here in a minute, so. Okay, so you're gonna open that all the way back up. So you're gonna have all these little panels to work with. And so this is my cover. I'm going to, I'm gonna show you first and then I'll explain. I'm gonna cut three panels into the corner of this one on that top one. Three panels the opposite side into that one and then the opposite side from that on this. So I do not have a Sharpie I would show you but so you're gonna have one, two, three, and you're gonna cut from this side. And then one, two, three, cut from this side. One, two, three, cut from this side. So that they're alternating. Ultimately, those cuts need to be alternating. Where did our scissors end up? Cool. Thank 
you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. So now I'm going to cut this and I'll show you what I mean. Okay. So I'm going to cut one, two, three in. Right. Hopefully tidier than that normally, but you know. Then the opposite direction on the next crease. Right. Opposite direction on this crease. Now I'm going to release these scissors to, OK. So this is your paper. And you see that? Three in this way, three in the opposite side, three in the opposite side. OK. And then you're going to fold this back and forth like an accordion book. So if you've ever made an accordion book, you know that it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So I'm going to fold this over and then refold it this way and refold it this way. And then when you get to this panel, which is the joint panel, you're going to fold down and then back forth, back and forth, back and forth, every layer. And then it'll turn into that little accordion book. And this one has a tendency to look really sloppy if you don't have adequate table space and you're folding in the air. But it'll do the basic thing that you're looking for. OK. Right? People waiting on scissors. Where are the locations of the scissors? OK. There's, yeah, I was going to say, there should be three pairs. And once you're done, just hand it to the next person who needs it. So those are four really basic folds that you can use with students or make on your own um, and produce in any quantity, however you want to do that. And then when people are done cutting, if, they, if they'd like to come up here and take a look at some of the stuff I've brought, that would be great. You're more than welcome. Just make sure your hands are clean for the sake of the, the these and also for us. And then I also brought a couple books that I use as a reference um, in my classes that I think are pretty good. So if you want to check those out, you're more than welcome to as well. And I will answer any questions that anyone has, too. <laughs> well, thanks for coming. Two questions. Yeah. It's much older than that, actually. And then the second question is, I know that you collect them. Is there a collectible market, meaning are there some folks who'd love to get a Hey Peak number one, right? And, the, and, the, and they're out there looking for Hey Peak one? So I have people that buy things from me specifically because they want to buy things from me. Um, whether or not they care about what like number it is or I don't know. I mean, I sell things in some quantity. It depends. Like I sell things at zine fests and whatnot. And then the term zines. Um, is, is old in the sense that it's been around for a while. And I think it originates from magazine. And so it's like a self-published little magazine. And so I think there's lots of different factions of people who maybe called them all different kinds of things. But they're essentially the same thing, right? Like, I mean, a pamphlet, depending on how it's designed and used, could conceivably be a zine. And so the versatility in that is interesting to me also. So does that answer? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, there's a lot of punk rock zines and like Riot Girl zines and that kind of that history is really rich with that term. So um, that's where I remember it's funny seeing. It. Yeah. Well, well, but I mean, it's like history in the sense that anything that is no, the past is. But um, yeah, yeah, and I think that's important to realize where those, how those terms are essentially the same and different depending on who's using them and what their purpose is and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of zine fests cropping up again. I think there is a desire for younger folks um, for tactile things again. Um, and comics are so, they've, ex they've sort of re-exploded. You know, you had underground comics, and you had superhero comics, and now everything is at the forefront, right? Like, it used to be like nerdy to like those things, and now it's everywhere. And there's all different kinds of comics. So I'm actually teaching a comic book illustration class this semester, and it's been super fun 
because we get to read all kinds of comics, and who doesn't like to read comics? But um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of regional zine fests happening. So Johnson City has one um, that's in August. So you should check it all. You should check it out. Um, and then there's one in Chattanooga that's been happening for, I think this is their seventh year. And uh, there's a number in Florida. And I mean, there's ones all over. Portland has a huge zine community. And cities tend to have, I mean, there's more people there. So there's going to be more people producing things like that. So um, if you do like a little bit of research, you can find all kinds of cool stuff. So when you do this with your foundation students, do you use this one or deep or? this figure, the first one that we did, and is this something that they do in that class with you from start to finish, or do they take it home? Or? So when I've assigned it in the past, I usually do the little booklet one with the cut, because yeah. um, there's something just sort of magical about that one. Yeah. <laughs> and they, I usually give them in class, we work on it, and then um, they're supposed to be done with it the following class, and then we trade. Then I go make copies of it, and we trade. But they, um, they do all the work in the class. Well, with art students, the expectation is that they'll do work outside of class as well. But you could, you could get it done in a class if people are really focused. When I was teaching foundations in Utah, there were 25 students in a class. And so getting around to everybody was really, was really a trick. And that was the other reason. It's when you have that many students in a class, it's a lot in one way. It's a lot for an art class. Um, getting them all to talk and not sort of recede into clicks um, is really important. <laughs> so I would sort of move them around immediately so that they knew that, you know, Meet this person now, so you interact with them now. And so part of drawing in class was that they would interact with each other. Like, how, how are you going to come up with the, like, the solution to this challenge and that kind of thing? And oh, I like how you did. Like, I like how you drew your dog, and my dog looks like this, and that kind of thing. So it, start, it naturally starts conversations that may not happen otherwise. Does anyone else have questions about anything? What's the best way to find out the rotation So um, that is an excellent question. Usually, you have to go onto the catalog and just see what's being offered. Uh, different professors have different rotations because of the, the different number of classes that happen per semester. So um, sometimes reaching out to the professor individually is actually the best bet. Say, like, do you know when such and such a class will be taught again? And usually, they have a good idea of when that is. Would you all like to come up and look at some zines? All right. So I ask that if you pick it up from one spot, if you could just sort of put it back in the same spot, because I do keep the, I keep them separated. The ones that I've brought from ETSU actually live in the, the printmaking room sort of archive so that I can show future students, you know, what former students have made. So. <laughs>